A-Level Paper 2, June 2017. I've got a reaction pathway here and I've got 1-bromopropane making compound J with sodium hydroxide. It, said it's, it says it's aqueous. In cold aqueous, that means it's got water, in cold water the OH minus, the lone pair of electrons on the O, attacks the delta plus on the C. Remember the C to Br bond is a polar bond. The Br is electronegative, draws electrons towards itself, and it's got a slight minus, leaving a slight plus, a delta plus on the C. And the lone pairs of electrons from the OH minus in cold water attack that C and bond with that C and make um, propan 1 ol the CBr bond breaks and the Br- minus comes off. So that's a process called nucleophilic substitution. The OH- minus is a nucleophile. It's a lone pair donor. Alternatively, incidentally, if that were warm ethanol, then the OH- minus would attack an H from this carbon here. So you go from the Br to the C to the next C and it attacks an H on here. The OH- minus removes that H the electrons from the CH move in between the two carbons to make a double bond and the Br comes off as a Br-. minus. That's a process called elimination and it would make propene. That's in warm ethanol, but the AQ tells you that it's nucleophilic substitution. The trickiest part, so it's easiest to lose a mark, is that it says displayed formula so you need to include all of the bonds in between the atoms including the bond between the O and the H. Name the mechanism for reaction 2. Well you've got nucleophilic substitution again and NH3 has got a lone pairs, pair of electrons on the N which again will attack the delta plus on the C and the CBr bond breaks and the Br comes off. In this mechanism that would make N plus H3, so it makes CH3, CH2, CH2, N plus CH3, and one of the hydrogens, the bond would break and move on to the N plus to remove the N plus, and H plus would be removed, and you'd make propylamine or one amino propane. So that mechanism again is nucleophilic because this is an electron pair donor, and it's replacing the Br with an NH2, an amino group, so that's uh, nucleophilic substitution. Condition. Well, for ammonia, you need excess ammonia. It's tempting to put temp uh, increased temperature or increased pressure, but with ammonia, you need excess ammonia. That's the condition for ammonia. Calculate the mass in grams of um, propylamine produced from 25.2 grams of 1-bromopropane in reaction 2, assuming a 75% yield. Well, let's work out what the yield would be if it were 100%, and then we can convert it to 75% at the end. 25.2 grams of 1-bromopropane. So what I've got to do first of all is moles is mass divided by MR. I've got to work out the MR of this using a periodic table and it turns out to be 122.9. Moles is mass divided by MR. So 25.2 grams of this divided by MR. I've got 0 0.205 moles. I know from my equation balancing it, then one mole of 1-bromopropane makes one mole of propylamine, 1 to 1. So if I've only got 0 0.205 moles of 1-bromopropane, I must make 0 0.205 moles of propylamine. So it makes 0 0.25 moles of propylamine. Now, what I could do with doing is working out its MR, so work out the MR of this. I've got a 14 for a nitrogen, 1 for the hydrogens, 12 for the carbons, and it works out as 58. Moles is uh, 0.205, is mass divided by MR, so 0.205 is mass divided by 58. The mass, therefore, is 0.205 multiplied by, that should say, 58, is 12.095 grams. So I should make, make 12.095 grams of this. I'm only making a 75% yield, three quarters, so I multiply it by 75, divide by 100%, I make 9.07 grams. If I look in my question, 25.2 is to three significant figures, so I need to make sure that's to three significant figures, 9.07 is to three significant figures. Before we can answer question 15, we need to just check our understanding. When I have a nucleophile like ammonia with a lone pair on it, it's a lone pair donor, 
it attacks the delta plus on the C of a polar bond. Br minus is slightly negative, delta negative, because it's electronegative and draws the electrons towards itself along the covalent C to Br bond. And that allows this nuclear vial, this ammonia, with its lone pair to bond to the C. And the electrons from the CBr move on to the Br minus, uh, move on to the Br, it forms Br minus. And then you end up with an N bonded to the C with three H's. There's a plus on the N because it's donated electrons. And then an H breaks off. The electrons go from one of the NH bonds onto the N. Uh, removes the H plus and removes the N plus and makes an H plus. Nucleophilic substitution. However, what you've made, ethylamine, has also got a lone pair here on the N. So this ethylamine can react with the bromoethane again. And therefore that N can lose another H and get another ethyl group. And then it can react again and lose another H and get another ethyl group. In other words, ethylamine can turn into diethylamine into triethylamine. So can convert from a primary amine into a secondary amine into a tertiary amine. And this triethylamine with a lone pair can attack that C again and actually get four ethyl groups. This time it ends up with an N+. plus. It can't get remove the plus because there's no longer any H's to um, to break off and move the electrons from an NH bond and remove the plus. So it makes this kind of compound called a quaternary ammonium salt which is used as a detergent. Let's have a look at the question here then now. I've got C9H21N is produced from reaction 2. So let's have a look at reaction 2. So reaction 2 involves propyl amine being made, propyl amine here, from 1-bromopropane. So once you've actually made this, the NH3 reacts and replaces with nucleophilic substitution, the Br, and you make this. Now this has got a lone pair of electrons on the N. The N can react again and replace this whole group then can replace this whole compound can replace the Br three times over. So it can create an N with three propyl groups on it. Three CH3, CH2, CH2s. So it keeps replacing the Br once, twice, three times over. So what you actually make is an N with one, two, three, with a CH2, CH2, CH3, CH2, CH2, CH3, CH2, CH2, CH3. And it's actually S for the skeletal formula, so you need to draw it in this way. Functional group including classification. It's got an N, so it's an amine, it's not an amide. An amide has an N bonded to a C double bond O. It's an amine, and it has three carbons bonded to the end, so it's a tertiary amine. So if we go back here, we've got a primary amine with one C joint bonded to the end. We've got a secondary amine with two Cs bonded to the end. And we've got a tertiary amine with three Cs bonded to the end. So it's a tertiary amine. Identify the reagent and the conditions used in reaction three. So in reaction three, look back at reaction 3. Reaction 3 here, the Br has been removed and I've now got C3H6. I've got a double bond. So this is the reaction that I talked about before. Instead of using sodium hydroxide in cold water, you've used sodium hydroxide in warm ethanol and it's reacted with an H from this CH2 here, removed it the CH, the electrons from the CH have moved between the two carbons to make a double bond and the Br has been eliminated. So you've got an elimination reaction. Let's have a look at the mechanism here. It's a little clearer here. The OH minus, instead of replacing the Br and attacking that C delta plus and the Br coming off, it goes from the Br to the C to the next C and it attacks one of these two H's here. It attacks that H and will form water, H2O. The minus 
has gone because electrons have moved away from this. Um, this is acting now as a base and removing an H+. Plus. The electrons move in between the two carbons and the electrons break, uh, move from that bond, that CBr, and it breaks the bond. It's elimination reaction because um, water is removed uh, from using that H plus there um, and a Br is removed. So this molecule becomes smaller. It's an elimination reaction. Identify the reagent used. So the reagent used, as I've said, is uh, sodium hydroxide again or potassium hydroxide, but this time it's in ethanol rather than in cold water. Question two. It asks us to draw a tangent to the curve at t equals zero, time equals zero. So we draw a tangent to this curve. It's got to touch at that point, a touch at time zero. It's got to touch the curve there, and it's got to try and just touch and be equidistant, equal distance coming down here, not crossing the line um, at any point. So not too sharp, not too shallow, just touching and uh, be equidistant, equal distance either side with the curve. You get a little bit of leeway either way. Use the tangent to use the initial rate. So the initial rate is th this rate here of the reaction. So you do that by doing the gradient. So you measure the height, which is 0 0.5. You measure the width, which is 10. So your answer is 0 0.5 divided by 10. It's actually a negative gradient because the line's coming down this way. If it were going back up the other way like that, it would be a positive gradient. This is a negative gradient. So it's minus 0 0.05, although you don't uh, lose a mark for forgetting the fact that it's a negative gradient. So 0 0.05 is my initial rate here. Let's have a look at the second part of the question. The experiment was repeated at the same temperature with the same initial concentration of B. What that means is, if it's at the same temperature, the rate constant K doesn't change. Only changing temperature, that's the only thing that can change the rate constant. Nothing else can change the rate constant, only temperature. So if the temperature stayed the same, the rate constant K has stayed the same. What else has stayed the same? The initial concentration of B has stayed the same. So rate equals K that stayed the same. A squared, concentration of A squared multiplied by the concentration of B and B has stayed the same. It now says that it's 1.7 times greater. So the rate was 1.7 times larger than it was in the original experiment. So if the rate has gone up by 1.7 times then the rate has gone up by 1.7 times 0 0.05. It's gone up 1.7 times this value. So A squared, since these other two are staying the same, K is staying the same and B is staying the same, A squared must have increased by 1.7 times as well. So if the rate's increased by 1.7 times and K is staying the same and B is staying the same, A squared has increased by 1.7 times. So um, what, how much has A changed by? A has changed by the square root 1.7. A has changed by 1.3 times what it was in the original experiment. Now, in the first experiment, the concentration of A was 0 0.5 at that rate. The concentration was 0 0.5 of A. A's concentration was 0 0.5 there when the line touched the curve at time zero. So A initially and the first experiment is 0 0.5. Now it's gone up by 1.3 times. So I multiply 0 0.5 by 1.3, 0 0.65, and it's to two significant figures because 1.7 is to two significant figures. Question three is a straightforward maths question. We've got a rate equals the rate constant multiplied by the concentration of C multiplied by the concentration of D. So we've got the rate equation. We've been given the initial rate, 3.1 times 10 to the minus 3. So we've got the rate. We don't know the rate constant K. That's what we're going to try and work out. We've been given the concentration of C and the concentration of D. So 0.0031 or 3.1 times 10 to the minus 3 is the rate equals the rate constant K that we don't know. 
multiplied by 0.48, which is the concentration of C, multiplied by 0.23, which is the concentration of D. So K is 0.0031 divided by these two numbers, and it comes out as 0.028, quite straightforward. Now we've got to work out the units of K. So the units of K will change each time depending on the rate equation. So the rate is always mol divided by dm3 and also divided by a second. It's like concentration, but it's per second. It's divided by seconds on the bottom. Equals the rate constant. Concentration is in moles divided by dm3. And we've got two of them. We've got a concentration of C and a concentration of D. So I've got moles divided by dm3 and moles divided by dm3. What I usually do then is I take the two mole dm3s on this side. If they're on this side of the equal sign, and I take them across the equal sign, they end up on the top. And the two moles on the top, if I take them across the equal sign, they end up on the bottom. Then I cancel top and bottom. I can cancel a dm3 from the top with one from the bottom, and it just leaves one on the top. I can cancel a mole from the top with a mole from the bottom, and it leaves a mole on the bottom, and I've got an s on the bottom. If I take a mole from the bottom up to the top, it becomes a minus one, and an s becomes minus one. So the units of k are dm3, that's on the top. A mole comes from the bottom up to the top becomes a mole minus 1 and an s becomes an s minus 1. 3.2 is another maths question, so I've got the Arrhenius equation. Um, use this equation in your answer from question 3.1. So let's remind ourselves what we did in question 3.1. So in question 3.1 we worked out k which was 0.028 So I can work out ln k, ln of 0.028 equals minus the activation energy. We don't know the activation energy, and I think that's what we've got to calculate. Calculate uh, a value in kilojoules per mole for the activation energy, yes. 8.31 is my gas constant, so that's R. Temperature is in Kelvin. So if we have a look at the gas constant here, it's Kelvin. So 25 degrees C. Add 273 on becomes 298. So I've got to get that into Kelvin. And then add LNA. LNA is 16.9. So in terms of maths, then the first thing I've got to do is I can work out LN 0.028, which works out at minus 3.58. I take the add 16.9 from the right-hand side across the equal sign. It becomes minus 16.9 equals uh, minus EA 8.31 times 298. The next thing I've done is I've calculated this, minus 3.58, take away minus 16.9, uh, take away 16.9 is minus 20.48. Act minus activation energy still, and I've multiplied these two out to give me 2482.6. To get minus EA, I'm going to multiply these two together now, and equals minus 50716. It's in joules per mole, because my gas constant is in joules, so that's in joules per mole. I've got a negative and negative on each side, so I'm going to call that a positive on each side. Now I'm going to reverse the signs on each side, so EA equals 50716 joules. Joules going to kilojoules, a small unit going to a bigger unit, I divide by a thousand. EA equals um, 50.716. However, I've rounded it to two significant figures because some of these values are to two significant figures, such as the temperature, 25 degrees C. So I always take my least accurate number, which is 25, and I go to that number of significant figures. So, give the name of this aldehyde CH3, CH2, 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 CHOH. So, the OH is the branch off this CH here, and then CN. So, CN is a nitrile. I've got 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6. So, I've got hexane nitrile, and I've, got, I've used up uh, the nitrile ending. Hexane nitrile, I've got, a two, I've got an OH at carbon number 2. The C of the CN is always carbon number 1, so the OH is bonded to carbon number 2. Now, if I've used the end in nitrile, I can't have an OL. I need to name the OH as a group, and that's a hydroxy group. So it's 2-hydroxyhexane nitrile. 
Describe how you distinguish between separate samples of the two stereoisomers of this. So this has got a chiral carbon here. It's got a C with an H. It's got an OH as a branch off that C. It's got a CN and then it's got a four carbon chain coming to the left. So that C is a chiral carbon. So this is going to have enantiomers. It's got optical isomers. So the way you distinguish it is that different enantiomers would rotate plane polarized light in opposite directions. Explain why the reaction produces a racemic mixture. Well, it's a racemic mixture because this aldehyde is planar. So the CN, which is um, a nucleophile, so that's a nucleophile, CN minus has got a lone pair of electrons and it'll attack the C of the uh, aldehyde group. And because the aldehyde group is planar, it can attack from above or below. And because it's planar, there's a 50-50 and equal chance of attack from above or below. So the aldehyde is planar, equal chance of attack from above or below by the CN minus ion, the cyanide ion, to produce equal amounts of each enantiomer. Sometimes an isomer of CH3, CH2, CH2, CHO reacts with KCN. So what happens with the KCN is that the CN minus ion and the lone pair of electrons on the C attacks the C of the CHO. So that forms a nitrile. It makes the chain one carbon longer by forming a CN at the end. And then the dilute acid then um, reacts to make an OH group at that end as well. So you'd have CHO turning into CH with an OH and a CN. So that C of the CHO becomes a chiral carbon. Now it's saying, however, there's an isomer. Remember, isomers of aldehydes are ketones. So I can have a, a ketone. The C double bond O doesn't need to be at the end. It can be somewhere else on the chain and therefore it becomes a ketone. So I'm probably looking for a ketone as an isomer and it does not show stereoisomerism. So I'm looking for a ketone with the C double bond O probably at carbon number three. You'll see what I mean now. So if the carbon double bond O has been at carbon number three, when the carbon, uh, when the C double bond O uh, becomes an OH and a CN joins on, then I end up with a carbon here without four different groups. So this has been a ketone here. This C double bond O has been here in the middle of the chain. Uh, the CN minus has, has reacted um, and bonded to the C with the C double bond O. It's it's added on, it's nucleophilic addition, and it's added on, and the C double bond O has broken, made an O minus with a lone pair of electrons that's then attacked the dilute acid, the H plus, and made the OH. But because the C double bond O of the ketone, the isomer of this aldehyde, is in the middle, when the OH makes and the CN makes, because these two groups, these two ethyl groups either side the same, that then is not a chiral carbon. So the justification is that this now doesn't have a chiral carbon. Question 5. Ethanoic acid and ethane 1,2-diol react together to make a diester. That's um, a molecule with two ester links, two COO links in there. And an ester link forms when you have a carboxylic acid reacting with an OH group. So let's have a look what we've got. We've got two lots of COOH. We've got two ethanoic acid molecules. And I've drawn one and I've drawn another at this end. You'll see why in a minute. And I've got ethane 1,2-diol. It's got an OH at either end, one on carbon number one and one on carbon number two. And what happens is when you get a carboxylic acid group and an alcohol group, an OH group, they can react together to make water especially if you've got something like a concentrated sulfuric acid as a catalyst that's going to help remove the water. And that reaction is called a condensation reaction. You make an ester, a COO group, um, and um, it's called a condensation reaction, and you make a condensation polymer. Now, at the other end, I've got a COOH here, and I've got an OH here. I'm just going to flip this around so we can see what's going on. So I've just flipped it around. Instead of it being CH3COOH, it's now going CH3COH 
from the right. And now we can see that the OH of the COH and the H of the alcohol can make water, and they can do it this side as well. The OH at this side and the H, um, so the OH of the carboxylic acid group and the H of the alcohol can make water on this side as well. And I'm going to remove those waters. So I've now removed uh, the OH of the carboxylic acid group and the H off the alcohol on that end and the uh, OH of the carboxylic acid group here and the H from here and now all I do is join them up and then that gives me the structure of the diester. I could draw it a little bit better if I wanted to, something like this, CH3CO, CH3CO, that's a double bond O and then I've got an OCH2, CH2O, OCH2, CH2O and then I've got an OC or a CO, uh, a, a carbon to oxygen double bond there, a CO and a CH3 at the end. Let's have a look what's happening next. I've got, um, an, at the start of a reaction, I've got ethanoic acid and I've got ethane 1,2-diol. I've not got any of my products yet. I've got 0 0.470 moles of ethanoic acid and I've got 0 0.205 moles of my ethane diol. At equilibrium, so this is a process called dynamic equilibrium, where the rate of the forward reaction, the rate of the backward reaction are the same and the concentrations of the reactants and products are no longer changing. At that point I've got 0 0.180 moles of my ethanoic acid left. So my first step is to work out how much has been used up. So if I take 0 0.470 and subtract 0 0.180, I can work out that 0 0.29 moles of ethanoic acid have been used up. Every time two moles of ethanoic acid are used up, it reacts with one mole of ethane diol, uh, ethane 1,2-diol. So one mole of my ethano sorry, two moles of my ethanoic acid react with one mole of my ethane 1,2-diol. So if I've just used up 0 0.29 moles of this, I must have used up half of that amount of ethanoic acid, 0 0.145 moles of this must have been used up. Now I can work out how much I've got left. I started with 0 0.205, I've used up 0 0.145, so I must have 0 0.205 subtracted 0 0.145, 0 0.06 is left over. How much of this is made? Well, every time one mole of ethane 1,2-diol react, I make one mole of my ester. So how much of this has, uh, has been reacted? 0 0.015 moles of this has been reacted, has been used up, so I must make 0.145 moles of this. Every time I make one mole of that, I make two moles of water, so if I double this, 0.145 multiplied by 2 gives me 0.29 moles of water. We're now required for 5.3 to write an expression for the equilibrium constant Kc for the reaction. So let's have a look what we've got. So we've got on the right hand side we've got the diester and we've got one of those so that's square brackets around that and we've got two waters so it's H2O square brackets squared divided by ethanoic acid in square brackets squared uh, and divided also by the ethane dioic acid in square brackets as well. So that will now look like that. It says you don't need to uh, measure the volume for concentration, you can just use moles. Well, moles is um, moles that you don't need to turn it into concentration. You can leave it as moles rather than dividing by volume, because if I divide by the volume once, twice, three times to turn these molar amounts, these moles, into concentration by dividing each of them by the volume, I'd be dividing three times here and three times here. In other words, the volumes cancel because there's equal number of moles on the left and right of the equation. So if we look back, there are three moles, two and one on the left hand side of the equation, three moles on the right hand side of the equation. So if I was converting moles into volume, I'd be dividing by three volumes on the top and three volumes on the bottom, and it would just the volumes would just cancel out. A different mixture of ethanoic acid, ethane, one, two, dial and water were prepared and left for each equilibrium and I've now got the concentrations of each. I need to calculate the concentration of this CH3COH um, and I've been given an equilibrium constant. So this is just maths where I'm putting numbers in. So 6.45 is the equilibrium constant here. I've got the concentration of the uh, diester, 0. 
802 multiplied by the concentration of water squared, 1.5 squared, uh, multiplied by, uh, sorry, divided by CH3COH concentration squared, I don't know that one, and multiplied by 0 0.264, 0 0.264, which is concentration of the ethane 1,2 dial on the bottom. Um, if I multiply this out then, and I then um, rearrange the equation, so 6.45, I've multiplied this out, 0 0.802 multiplied by 1.5 squared is 1.06, 1 and then I have um, multiplied, so taken this from the bottom on the right hand side and moved it to the top on the left hand side, uh, and then I've multiplied that out, 1.7, divided them by, um, swapped them over, so 1.06 1 divided by 1.7, um, it which equals 6, 0.624 equals the concentration of ethanoic acid squared. Square root it, 0 0.789 is the concentration of the ethanoic acid. And I've done it to three significant figures because the other values are to three significant figures also. Question 6. Use the data book to help you answer this question because you're going to have to draw some amino acids. The question about amino acids and peptide amide links. Um, so a peptide link or an amide link is a CO, C double bond O and an NH. We'll have a look at that more in a minute. Draw the Zwitter ion formed by phenylalanine. So we need to draw phenylalanine to start off with from the data book. A Zwitter ion. A Zwitter ion loses an H plus from the COOH. So if that loses an H it becomes COO and if it loses an H plus it becomes COO minus so that n becomes coo minus and the h plus joins on at this end so instead of it becoming nh2 it's now become nh3 with a plus and the plus is on the n so it'll look like that you can draw just draw this end if you want as coo minus rather than drawing it out as a full displayed formula draw the structure of serine at high ph well let's have a look what serine is serine is this now um Low pH is acid, so acids would add or donate H pluses, and they go on this end, on this NH2, and make NH3 plus. But at high pH, that's base or alkali. Now, base or alkali accept H pluses. So a base, high pH, is going to accept H pluses. It's going to take H pluses off this, and it's going to take an H plus off here, and it's going to form COO minus instead of COO. H. Draw the structures of both peptides formed when phenylalanine reacts with serine. So let's have a look what phenylalanine is. It's that straight from the data book. Let's have a look what serine is. Now we can look here. A carboxylic acid group and an amine group react to make water. The H and the O, the OH of the carboxylic acid group, react with one of the H's of the NH2 and it leaves behind CONH and that's the peptide link that's going to form. Let's have a look. Let's take off the OH and the H. So I've now taken off the OH off the COH, and I've taken off one of the H's here, and all I do is join the two up. If I now join the two up, I have now made one of the two dipeptide. A dipeptide is two amino acids joined together. And this here, my CONH, is my peptide or my amide link. Right, what happens if they're the other way around? Well, let's draw them the serine on the left and the phenylalanine on the right. Well, the same thing can happen here this way around as well. The OH of the carboxylic acid group now and the serine can react with an H off the NH2 group, the amine group of the phenylalanine. Let's remove those two now. There we go. We've removed them now. And now we just draw a line between the two. And we've made another dipeptide with another peptide link. Question 6.4. An amide link is also formed when nacyl chloride reacts with a primary amine. So here's nacyl chloride. It's got a COCl, a C double bond O and a Cl. And a primary amine's got an NH2. The N is bonded to 1C.
So what happens? Well, an acyl chloride reacts very violently. It's a dangerous chemical. It's very corrosive and reacts with other chemicals to make HCl, hydrogen chloride gas, which appears as white steamy fumes. It reacts too violently, really, um, uh, for it to be sometimes safe to use. So we've got to be very careful when we use an acyl chloride because it reacts very, very vigorously, very, very violently. So what actually happens is, well, the COCl, it loses the Cl from this end, uh, which reacts with an H off an NH2. So it's going to make CH3, CH2, CO. The Cl and the H come off, and then there'll be left an NH, a CH2, and a CH3. And the amide link, the CO, NH2, will be in the middle. Um, let's have a look at the mechanism, and then we can work out the name of the organic product formed. So what actually happens is, the primary amine has got a lone pair of electrons on the N and it bonds to the C. Now a common mistake is that you think the Cl comes off first, but it doesn't. The double bond breaks and the O accepts the electrons. I sometimes call this, um, jokingly, a lone shark because what it does is it says, I'll help you out and it helps out by breaking that carbon to oxygen double bond and makes a single bond, but then it wants to reform it again in the next step. So it helps out and then reforms it again in the next step. So in the first step, the NH2 is bonded onto the C. The C double bond O has broken and left a single bond, and the pair of electrons from the bond has gone onto the O. The O becomes minus because it's had, had an arrow going onto it, it's had electrons going onto it, and the N becomes plus because that's had electrons moving away from it, an arrow going away from it. The NH2 I've drawn as a displayed formula now with two H's and then the CH2Cl, CH2CH3 rather, here. Now I've got to have three arrows. I mentioned about the O sort of helping out, um, breaking the double bond to leave a single so the carbon still has four bonds here, doesn't have too many bonds. But now the pair of electrons, and it's the arrow from the pair of electrons, goes back into the bond to reform the carbon to oxygen double bond. At the same time, the bond from the CCl now breaks to make Cl minus. That will make a Cl minus, and the Cl has gone from here now. And an H breaks off as well, um, and the, the electrons from the NH bond, it can be either of these two NH bonds, goes on to the N to remove the plus charge and to release an H plus. And the H plus and the Cl minus will make HCl. Uh, the end loses its charge because it's had electrons moved onto it and it's now only got NH and then CH3, CH2. It's called addition elimination because first of all everything adds together and then secondly um, atoms and molecules are eliminated, removed. We've lost a Cl and we've lost an H which will come off. And so I've made this chemical here. How do I name it? So I name it because I look at the N group and I name what's on the N group, and that's an ethyl. It's not a CH3, it's a CH2CH3. So it's not a methyl, a CH3, it's a CH2CH3, it's an ethyl on the N. So I call it N-ethyl to show the position of the ethyl, because the ethyl could be somewhere else, like here. But it's not, it's actually on the N. N-ethyl. Then amides end in amide, and I count the number of carbons, one, two, and I count that one there as well, three, propanamide. I drop the E, otherwise it would be propane amide, and I'd have two vowels together. Question seven. I've been provided with four different samples, four different compounds, K, L, M, and N. I've got to use the minimum number of tests to decide which, which is which. Well, first of all, I think I eliminate two of them or work out which two are the carboxylic acid groups. K and M have carboxylic acid groups, COH. So I think, first of all, I add sodium carbonate and K and M will F of S or give bubbles. L and N will not. Now I know uh, L and N and I could add warm Tollens reagent and the one that gives the silver mirror then is N, because that's got an aldehyde on. Alternatively, I could use failing solution, which would give a brick red precipitate. I actually then don't need to do a test now, so I've saved myself one of the tests. Uh, I don't need to test L, because I know it must be um, the uh, bromoalkane. Although if I wanted to, I could add acidified silver nitrate, which would give a cream precipitate with a BR. A CCL gives a white precipitate, and a CI 
gives a yellow precipitate. So I could do that test if I felt like it, if I wanted to, although I don't really need to because I've already identified it by a process of elimination. And now I just need to distinguish between K and M. Well, I've got a secondary alcohol on this one. So my secondary alcohol, my COH, has got two carbons bonded to it. This M1, this other carboxylic acid group here, uh, this one hasn't got any OHs. So I could test for an OH by using acidified potassium dichromate, which would go orange to green. It goes orange to green with primary and secondary alcohols. It doesn't do so with a tertiary alcohol. Question 8.1. Nitrobenzene reacts uh, when heated with a mixture of concentrated nitric acid and concentrated sulfuric acid to form a mixture of three isomeric dinitrobenzenes. So this mixture of concentrated nitric acid and concentrated sulfuric acid is used to put an NO2 group onto a benzene ring or an NO2 group onto a nitrobenzene ring. Um, a ring is full of electrons, full of delocalized moving electrons. So they attack... Um, uh, species that are plus charged in electrophilic substitution. So the benzene rings are electrophiles. They have arrows coming away from them, electrons coming out of the benzene ring where it's um, got delocalized electrons and attacks something which is plus charged. So if I'm trying to add an NO2 group onto a ring, it needs to be plus charged. I need to make an NO2. So let's have a look. You need to remember HNO3 is nitric acid you need to remember h2so4 is no2 is is sulfuric acid you need to remember if you're adding a nitro group an no2 group it needs to be plus charged for the ring to attack it um, you you may work out that there's water made as well from the h's and the o's and then by a process of elimination you can work out that you make h2 hso4 there's one h left over there's an s needed and there's four o's the minus i'm not sure why it's down there should be at the top there hso4 with a minus at the top and you can work that out by a process of elimination so that you can balance the equation outline the mechanism of the reaction with nitrobenzene to form one three dinitrobenzene so if i've got a nitro group here let's say here it could be anywhere on the ring but it's at carbon number one one two three i'm trying to add a nitro group here so an electro electrons go from the ring and attack the no2 plus and then i put the no2 where i want it to be one three so that's carbon number one here that's got the original no2 group on it two three so i've put the other no2 group there there's an h on each of these corners that's not shown on each of these carbons in the ring and so the h i've had to show now i've done a horseshoe with a plus in the middle so the ring has got a plus because it's had electrons go away from it the no2 has lost the plus because it's had electrons put onto it so the plus is in the ring and i draw a horseshoe with the gap in the horseshoe around this area here where the substitutions taking place the h is broken off so the, the electrons from the h uh, carbon to hydrogen bond move into the ring through the horseshoe question 8.3 i've got two dinitrobenzenes and it's asking me to determine the rf value of one of these uh, on this chromatogram here so what i do is i measure from the start line to the spot and I measure from the start line to the solvent front and I divide the, the smaller by the larger. So I divide the, the distance from the start line to the spot by the distance from the start line to the solvent front. Uh, that works out as 0.62. So the answer is D. State in general term what, de what determines the distance traveled by a spot in a thin layer chromatogram and thin layer chromatography. So um, what is it in general terms? Well, it depends on two factors, really. It depends on how well the sample dissolves in the solvent, the moving phase, the solvent rises up the plate, and how well it adheres, or a process called retention, how well it adheres or is retained uh, to the paper, how well it sticks to the paper. The paper's not moving, so that's called the stationary phase. To obtain the chromatogram, TLC plate was held by the edges and placed in the solvent in the beaker and a fume cup the lid was replaced. Give one other practical requirement when placing the plate in the beaker. Well, the solvent line should be, the solvent depth should be below the starting line. So you can't have the solvent 
uh, above the starting line it's got to be below the starting line otherwise um, it will um, it will dissolve any of the spots that are above the starting line so it won't rise up and carry the spot with it it will just dissolve the spot into the solvent so the solvent depth should be below the starting line um, the second uh, thin layer chromatography experiment was carried out um, using 1,2 dinitrobenzene and 1,4 dinitrobenzene. Identical plate was used before. In this experiment, the RF value of 1,4 dinitrobenzene was found to be greater than that of 1,2 dinitrobenzene. So the 1,4 dinitrobenzene has traveled further up the plate than 1,2 dinitrobenzene. Deduce the relative polarities of 1,2 dinitrobenzene and 1,4 dinitrobenzene. And when We'll explain why 1,4 dinitrobenzene has the largest RF value. So the largest RF value means it's gone further up the plate. Um, so if it's gone further up the plate, the, um, the RF value of 1,4 dinitrobenzene is larger. So the 1,4 dinitrobenzene has gone further up the plate. If it's gone further up the plate, the 1,4 dinitrobenzene has dissolved um, better in the sample than the 1,2 dinitrobenzene. So if it's gone further up the plate, um, it means that the 1,4 dinitrobenzene has dissolved better in the solvent or the moving phase, and it's not adhered or been retained to the paper as much as the 1,2 dinitrobenzene. So this 1,4 dinitrobenzene um, dissolves better in the moving phase in the solvent and doesn't adhere as well to the paper as does the 1,2 dinitrobenzene. The reason that that is, is if it doesn't adhere to the paper, it's less polar. So if something adheres to the paper, it tends to be polar. It has polar bonds within it. So the 1,4 dinitrobenzene is less polar than the 1,2 dinitrobenzene. A third thin layer chromatography experiment was carried out. An identical plate was used under the same condition. The student stated that the RF value of 1,2 dinitrobenzene in his third experiment would be greater than 1,2 dinitrobenzene. Is the student correct? So, the solvent that they're using is ethylethanoate. Now, ethylethanoate, ethanoate is an ester. It's got C double bond O uh, bonds in there. It's got polar bonds within it. So, ethylethanoate is polar. Polar molecules dissolve better in polar solvents. Something that's polar bonds to something else that's polar uh, with intermolecular dipole-dipole attractions. So polar molecules dissolve better in a polar solvent. The 1,2 dinitrobenzene being polar will therefore dissolve better than it did do before because this ethylethanoate is polar. So dinitrobenzene is polar. So is the ethylethanoate, it will dissolve better than before. If it dissolves better than before, it rises further up the plate and the RF value will be larger. Therefore, the student was Just a quick recap then before we do the next question. We have phosphate groups, two phosphate groups here that bond to the OHs here on a 2-deoxyribose. And the H and the OH are removed to make water. So I've removed them now and the OH and the OH um, remove to make water and then I just join them up and that's how a phosphate uh, joins to a 2-deoxyribose above and below to make the central DNA chain. How does a base join on? Well a base uses the NH at the lower part of uh, on the data sheet. Every base, each of the four bases, has got an NH at the bottom and it's that that bonds to this other OH here so it's not on the main chain it's branching off the chain and that makes water remove it um, and then if you join here I've shown it removed with the H and the OH removed and then you just join it together and now I've now got a base joined on um, and that then shows you the positions of the OHs that bond on the phosphate to the 2-deoxyribose and the OH then that bonds to the base. And the position, the blue lines, the NHs are where the bases join onto this OH and use an H with an OH to form a bond then between that carbon and each of these nitrogens. The other circles, the N's and the O's, the single N's and the O's have got lone pairs on them. So you should draw lone pairs on those on your data sheet as you go into your exam. And then we use uh, 
The bonding, I say uh, jokingly, that it's a little bit like um, Ghostbusters where the streams can't cross. So you draw top to top and then you go round one on each case and you go round one again on each case and that gives three bonds between guanine and cytosine, three intermolecular hydrogen bonds. And then from the top to the top between adenine and thymine and then round one again on um, from adenine to thymine between an H plus and a lone pair of electrons. So you can see how all of those join up in the streams or the hydrogen bonds don't cross and there's bonds between lone pairs of electrons on O's and N's and between the H pluses on this um, very polar bond here of the NH2s. So let's how, see how this works on this question here. So what is Y? Well, Y is a phosphate group. So we decided there's a phosphate group coming down here from the two deoxyribose. And what's going off this OH here? So this OH would have then, um, so X is a base rather, the Y is the phosphate group. So I've got a phosphate group here and the base X is, is uh, the base is on the X part here. Now let's have a look at what this could be. So we're going to identify this. So we go back and we're looking at a base that hasn't got any oxygens on it. It's got no oxygens at all. Well, guanine, cytosine and thymine have got oxygens, so I've got adenine. So this now is an adenine molecule here, an adenine base. So what does an adenine base join with? An adenine base joins with a thymine base and the NH2 on the adenine joins to an oxygen with the lone pairs of electrons on the oxygen being attracted with a hydrogen bond to the NH2 and the N on the adenine just around from the NH2 is attracted to the NH of the thymine. So what I would tend to do then is I would draw a thymine here. I'd have my data book alongside here and I know that my NH2 on my adenine bonds to an O with lone pairs of electrons. I draw the lone pairs of electrons and these two are going to bond then now. The NH2 on the adenine and the O on the thymine are going to bond. What else is going to bond? That N there on the adenine round from the NH2. That's the, that bond, that, that one there. I draw a pair of electrons on that and that is going to bond onto my NH this one here. So I need to flip this over because that's bonding to that and that is bonding to this. So I'm going to flip it over now. So I've got my O bonding to this and my NH which is there is now flipped over here. I've drawn it backwards and now I'll put my, I'll just spin it a little bit as well and I'll put my lone pairs on. I'll put my delta pluses on and I'll draw my hydrogen bonds. There are two. Question 10 is about isomers of C6H10O2. We've got one of the isomers P here, and they want us to name it. So 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. It's pent. There are five in a line. Pentanoic acid, except it's not an anoic acid. It's not an ane. It's an ene. Pentenoic acid. If the carboxylic acid group is at number 1, then the uh, enoic acid, the ene bit is at carbon number 2. So pent to enoic acid. The ene, E-N-E, -E, and the O, I need to drop the E. So it's pent to enoic acid with a methyl group at number 2 as well. And it looks like it's a Z isomer because of a go. Uh, I've got no free rotation about the carbon to carbon double bond. And so I've got two different groups to the left of the carbon-carbon double bond. I've got two different groups to the right of the double bond. It's got geometrical isomers. Uh, if a trace from this C, H has got an atomic number of 1. The C bonded this way has got an atomic number of 6. So this group here, this ethyl group, takes priority. To the right, I've got carbon, uh, atomic number 6. And I've got a carbon, atomic number 6, both ways. So I carry on down the chain. Uh, hydrogen with an atomic number 1. After the carbon, I've got an atomic number an O with an atomic number 8. So this one takes priority. So it's Z. So my answer is Z. 2 methyl. So this is carbon number 1 on the carboxylic acid group. The methyl is on carbon number 2. Pent 2 enoic acid. I've dropped the E 
uh, after the een so that I don't end up with two vowels together, an e and an o for the enoic acid. The sample of P was mixed with excess oxygen. The mixture was ignited, so P is going to be ignited. Um, excess oxygen, so it's complete combustion. I'm make, going to make carbon dioxide and water. I'm not going to make carbon monoxide or carbon with incomplete combustion. I've got plenty of oxygen. After cooling to the original temperature, the total volume of gas remaining was 335. I'm just going to skip. Write an equation for the combustion of P. I'm going to have a look and see what it is. So I've got C6H10O2. And I've got 702, I'll work out why I've got 7.5 in a minute. I'm going to make CO2 on water. The best thing to balance first, 6 C's, so I'm going to need 6 CO2. I've got 10 H's, so I'm going to need 5 H2O. 5 twos are 10 to balance the uh, H's. And therefore I've got 12 O's plus 5. 17 O's, I've got 2 there, so there's 15 in this. That's why 7.5 times 2 is 15. Now, it tells me that after cooling the original temperature, that means that any water has now condensed back to room temperature, back to 25 degrees C. So there's two gases left in the system. There's carbon dioxide and there's any leftover oxygen. It says after this gas mixture has passed through sodium hydroxide, the carbon dioxide reacted and the volume of gas decreased to 155. So it's come down from 335 to 155, and it's because the carbon dioxide has been removed. So if I subtract those two numbers, I work out I've got 100 centimeter, 180 centimeter cubed of carbon dioxide. Now it wants me to do something with this carbon dioxide. Clearly, it's given me a gas constant. So it'd only be giving me a gas constant if it wanted me to use PV equals NRT. So have I got a pressure? Yes, 105 kilopascals. It needs converted into pascals. A large unit like a kilopascal is down into a smaller unit and multiply by a thousand. So 105 kilopascals is 105,000 pascals. Um, what else do I need? I need volume. Well, I've got volume 180 centimeter cubed, but I need to convert that into meters cubed. So to turn small into large, centimeter cubed into decimeter cubed, I divide by a thousand, so that would be 0 0.180. And then to get decimeter cubed into even larger meters cubed, I divide by a thousand again. So it turns out to be 180 divided by a thousand divided by a thousand again. It turns out to be 0 0.000180 meters cubed. So I've got P, I've got the N number of moles I won't know. R is the gas constant, I'm always given that 8.31. And temperature needs to be in Kelvin. It tells me there temperature has got to be in Kelvin and I've got temperature in degrees C add 273 so that's 298. So I add all and put all the numbers in and multiply some of them out 18.9 now equals N multiplied by 2476.38. N is the number of moles of carbon dioxide we've got to remember that because we've worked out it for the volume of carbon dioxide so N is the number of moles of carbon dioxide is now 18.9 divided by 2476.38 equals 0 0.007632. I've worked out the number of moles of carbon dioxide. So I've got quite a lot of these marks now already. I've probably got three or four marks already. Um, now it says it wants me to work out um, the mass of P used. Well, in my equation, six moles of carbon dioxide uh, are made when one mole of P this chemical P, C6H10O2, are reacted. So if I've got 0. Um, if I've got 0 0.007632 moles of carbon dioxide, the amount of P used, C6H10O, must be a sixth of that. So I'll take this number and I'll divide by 6, and now it works out as 0. 0.001272 is the number of moles of P. Now I've got the number of moles of P, I can work out the MR of P, every carbon's a 12, every hydrogen's a 1, every oxygen's a 16, and the MR will come out to be 114. So moles is mass divided by MR. Moles, I've just worked out the number of moles of P by dividing the number of moles of carbon dioxide by 6. 0.001272 equals the mass of P divided by 114. So the mass of these two numbers multiplied together, 0 0.145 grams, except finally it wants it in milligrams. A large unit down to a smaller unit and multiply by 1,145 milligrams. 
Question 10.3. Isom Q C6H10 O2 is cyclic, so it's got some kind of a ring in it. We can't assume that there are six carbons in a ring. There could be five or four. The infrared spectrum of Q is shown below, and the carbon-13 NMR spectrum of Q is shown below that. So let's have a look here. Right, I've got a very broad peak here. If it were 3,500 like this here, it would be an alcohol. But because it's slightly lower and between 25 and 3,000, that's a carboxylic acid. So I've got a carboxylic acid here and I can check that from my data book. The carboxylic acid has got to be a branch off the chain because a carboxylic acid, the C of the COOH, the carboxylic acid, has got a double bond oxygen and an OH. So it's already got three bonds. So the fourth one uh, must be off the ring. It must be joining a ring, not within a ring, because within a ring it needs two carbons either side of it in the ring. So the carbon, uh, the carboxylic acid must be off the ring. Now I've got six C's and one of them's in a COOH, so I must have five in a ring with a COOH off that. So I think I've got something looking like that. Five carbons in a ring and a COOH off that. Let's just check out the carbon-13 spectrum uh, and let's just check. I've got four different peaks, so I've got four different carbon environments. I'm going to have one there. That's a carbon that's different from the rest because it's got three carbons bonded to it. These two are symmetrical and they're different again. So that's the third kind and those two are symmetrical, a fourth kind. So I've got four different peaks in that, so that matches up okay so far. Um, I've got one of those carbons, so I've got a peak of integration height one, let's say. I've got another single carbon, that's that one there, one of that type. And then I've got two of this type, and that's a double height peak, a double integration height peak. And then I've got two here with another double integration height peak. So I've found the chemical, I found the isomer. Evidence from figure four, so that's from the infrared spectrum. So it's got an OH carboxylic acid peak at 2,500 to 3,000. Remember, always quote the numbers from your data book. And evidence from five, it's got four peaks of so four different carbon environments. That matches that. And from the integration uh, or the height of the peaks, um, two of the carbons are the same. Um, and then I've got a single carbon uh, in one environment. I've got another single carbon in another environment. So I've got two peaks of height integration uh, one and two peaks of integration two. Isomers R and S are shown. So for 10.4, we've got two isomers. They look fairly similar, except in this case, the carbon carbonyl groups, the C double bond O groups, are at carbons number two and five, whereas here they're at three and four. And that's going to be critical in a minute. Although the carbon-13 spectra of RNS both show the same number of peaks, the spectra can be used to distinguish between the isomers, um, give the number of peaks and justify how we can use the spectra to determine between them. Well, the number of peaks, they're both completely symmetrical. Okay, we've got a CH3 at either end, they'll give one peak, they're in the same environment. We've got a CO at carbons 2 and 5, they'll give a second environment. And the CH2 is at 3 and 4, will give a third carbon environment. So that's got three peaks. It says they've both got the same number of peaks, so this should have three also. Let's check. Two CH3s at either end. Yes, that's one peak, one carbon environment, one peak. CH2 is next at carbons 2 and 5. That's the second peak. And then the two COs at 3 and 4. They're both uh, the third peak. So they've both got three peaks. Now, how can we use that? How can we use the data to determine between them? Well, we've now got to look at the shift pattern. So we've got to look at the delta shift, the shift um number the shift value so let's have a look at the shift value for a carbon bonded to a co you can see that's a bold carbon so that any carbons bonded to a co have a shift value between 20 and 50 so how many carbons are bonded to a c with an o one two 
three, four. All four of those carbons are bonded to a C with an O. Now two of them are of the same. We've got a peak there from the CH3s and a peak there from the CH2s. So we've only got two peaks out of the four, but both of those peaks will be in the range 20 to 50 because all of those carbons, the two methyl groups, which are equivalent um, and have uh, got carbons in the same environment, give one peak and both of those are bonded to a C with an O, so we'll be in this uh, range. And the two CH2s will give a single peak, they're equivalent, and they will give um, a peak in this range as well, because they're bonded to a CO. So this one gives two peaks in the range 20 to 50. Whereas this one only has the two CH2s bonded to COs. So these two CH2s, which form a single peak, because they've got carbons um, in the same environment that single peak there from those two will be in the 20 to 50 but this ch3 is not in the 20 to 50 range it only has one peak s only has one peak in the 20 to 50 range the hydrogen spectra of rns both show the same number of peaks uh, but again this can be used so let's have a look how many peaks will there be how many hydrogen environments one two for this one so we've got ch3 three h is there and three h is there that's one environment ch2 ch2 these are second environments so this will have an integration value of six these will have an integration value of four these ones i've got two ch3s that's one peak and i've got two ch2s equivalent with the h2s there that will give a second peak and I've got an integration pattern 6 to 4 again. So the number of peaks are 2. It's going to give 2 peaks because I've got 2 different hydrogen environments in both. And with an integration pattern of 6 to 4 in both cases. So that's not going to help me. So maybe I can look at the splitting pattern. So let's have a look at the splitting pattern. That CH3 there and that CH3 there is bonded to a C with no H's. So that's a singlet. That's going to give a singlet. This CH2 is bonded this way to a CH2, so that's going to give to this uh, split into a triplet by those two H's. So that's going to give a singlet and a triplet. So R gives a singlet and a triplet. Whereas S gives that CH3 is going to be split by a CH2 into a triplet, but this CH2 is going to be split the H's are going to be split into a quartet, so that's going to give a triplet and a quartet. And so it's the splitting patterns that are going to be able to determine which isomer is which. Question 10.6. The action of heat on 5-hydroxyhexanoic acid can lead to two different products. Well, we better work out what 5-hydroxyhexanoic acid is, first of all. So... Um, Hexanoic acid, a carboxylic acid, that's carbon number one here, six carbons, one, two, three, four, five, six, and there's a hydroxy group, an OH group at number five, one, two, three, four, five. Let's draw it as a displayed formula. So I've got COOH here, CH2, 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 CH, CH3OH. So the OH is on carbon number 5. Here's carbon number 6. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6. <coughs> With the OH at carbon number 5. OK, on gentle heating, 5-hydroxyhexanoic acid loses water, so it's a condensation reaction to form a cyclic compound. It's going to go round in a circle. So what can happen? Well, a carboxylic acid group can react with an OH group. So it could react with itself because it's got a carboxylic acid group at one end and no H at the other. So this end could react with this end in the presence of concentrated sulfuric acid. Then uh, this happens, you lose the OH from the carboxylic acid end and the H from this end, like that. So I've lost the OH from here and I've lost the H from there. I'll just take it back again. And now these will bond. So this will bond, it will make a C double bond, O, O. It's going to make an ester. We can tidy that up a little bit by drawing it in a bit more of a cyclic structure. 
by drawing it a little bit like that. You could draw the displayed formula and carbons on if you want. I've just done the sort of skeletal formula. But you could do, let's have a look, CH3 to a C. There's my CH3 to a C. Bonded to an O. Bonded to an O. Bonded round to a C double bondo. C double bondo. And then CH2, 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 CH2. Back round again. So you could tidy it up a little bit like that. A polyester, so it says draw, draw the repeating unit of the polyester and name the type of polymerization. So instead of going around in a circle, they could just add on in a long line. So here we go, I've drawn it again, and now I've drawn it again without the OH on of the carboxylic acid and without the H on of the alcohol. But instead of joining around in a circle, these could just join on to each other in a big long chain. And I've drawn it out here a little bit better. So I've done O, C, H, 3, O, C, O, C, H, C, H, 3. I've drawn the C, H, 3 up there and it's down in this diagram. But it's the same thing. C, H, 2, C, H, 2, C, H, 3. C, H, 2, C, H, 2, C, H, 2 rather. Three C, H, 2s. There they are. Um, and then a C double bond O. And I've put... A line out, a bond going out to show that it's a long polymer and this is just one unit of the long polymer. It's a condensation reaction. Question 10.7, isomer U. I've got an isomer with a carbon to carbon double bond and it says draw the repeating units of the polymer formed by U. So what I usually do is when I have the double bond here, I usually put these two groups and these two groups pointing up and down. So you should put an H pointing up and an H pointing down for those two H's and a CH3 pointing down and all of this group pointing up. And then all I need to do is break the double bond and put a bond out either side. So it can be an addition polymer where the double bond breaks and a bond goes out either side. So it will look a little bit like this. I could have put the two H's up and down and done the displayed formula with the H up and down to allow myself room to come out this side. I've done that on this side. I've pointed this ester group up here on the top and the CH3 down the bottom to point it out. But I've broken the double bond and made an addition polymer now with single bonds. Um, just to find the statement that although both polymer structures uh, contain ester groups. The polymer formed by U is not biodegradable. Well, it's got a carbon backbone. Carbon to carbon bonds um, are not easily broken. They're not hydrolyzed to reaction with water. So they're not biodegradable like um, amide links are or peptide links are or ester links. They're biodegradable. You can react them with water and a little bit of acid or alkali and it will reintroduce the water and break the, the ester or the amide bonds. But these are not broken by water. They're very strong carbon to carbon bonds and therefore they're not biodegradable. They don't react with water. This question is about three amines. Remember an amine has an N in it. Um, this one's a primary amine, this one's a primary amine, this one's a secondary amine. The primary amine, the N, is bonded just to one carbon N just bonded to one carbon, whereas this N is bonded to two carbons, this carbon here and this carbon here. So we've got two primary and a secondary amine. Um, they're weak bases. So remember what a base does. A base reacts with an acid. Acids make H pluses and bases react with the H pluses. So which ones of these are weak? Well, they all seemingly are weak bases. So they're, they're, they're not reacting with acids um, readily. Explain the difference in the base strength of the three amines and give the order of increase in base strength. So why might each of these react with an H+. plus? The reason they react with an H+, plus is because there's a lone pair of electrons on the N. The question is, how available is that lone pair of electrons? You could think of it how large it is, how much of it is there, but we say how available it is. Well, on this E, the lone pair of electrons is withdrawn into the ring. A wing, ring will withdraw electrons into it. So the availability of the lone pair of electrons on that NH2, with it being so close to a ring that's withdrawing the electrons, is very small. So if that's not very available, then it's not available to bond to an H+, and that's going to be a very weak base. 
This one, however, is a long way from the um, from the ring, and so the electrons from this won't be as withdrawn as much. And I've got CH2, CH3, like methyl groups, they'll push electrons away from themselves. CH2s and CH3s even more so push electrons away from themselves, and so um, that's going to be more available on here on this uh, nitrogen. There'll be a more available. Uh, lone pair on that nitrogen because the lone pair is further away from the ring and we've got CH2 groups pushing electrons onto the end so that's more available and that's going to be a strong base a st the strongest base of them all and this one's somewhere in between it's got an N right next to the ring so that's going to withdraw but it's got a CH2 and a CH3 that's going to repel electrons and make it slightly more available so this is somewhere in the middle so let's actually have a look again then. So uh, the N on the lone pair reacts with an H+, plus, acts as a base. We've said that. The ring withdraws electrons into the ring. We've said that. The delocalization into the ring lowers the availability of the lone pair. Delocalization means just pulling or withdrawing electrons or moving electrons. The delocalization into the ring, moving the electrons into the ring, withdrawing them into the ring, lowers the availability of the lone pair. Yes, that, that we've, we've said that, and lowers the base strength. Yes, so if it's less available, it's less available to bond to an H+, plus, and it's a weaker base. The nearer the N is to the ring, the weaker the base, and the CH2, CH3 repel electrons and increases the availability of the lone pair, increasing F and G base strength. And so the order is um, least available, least available lone pair, weakest base, most available, lone pair well away from the ring and I've got a CH2, CH2 repelling electrons onto the N making it more available as a lone pair to bond to the H plus and then G somewhere in the middle. Tough question 11.2, the final question on the paper. Amine F can be prepared by three step synthesis, that means there's three steps in making or, or turning Methyl benzene starting from methyl benzene into amine F. So we've got to get methyl benzene, which is a benzene ring with a CH3 on it, into amine F, and there's going to be three steps. We need to work out what the steps are, give reagents and conditions. We don't need equations and mechanisms, but structures of what's going on. So let's have a look at amine F and let's have a look at methyl benzene. So let's go back and have a look at amine F. Amine F is a benzene ring but it's got a CH2, CH2, NH2. And methyl groups only got a CH3. I've added not just the NH2, but I've added an extra carbon. The only way I can add an extra carbon is by adding a cyanide, using cyanide, potassium cyanide. So I need potassium cyanide to add onto um, this chain. Now, a methyl group won't, attack, won't allow potassium cyanide, a cyanide ion, to add on. So the methyl group needs to turn into something like have a Cl on it or a Br on it so that the Cl- minus can replace with nucleophilic substitution that Br. So let's have a look then. So methyl benzene, I need to, to, I need to put a Cl onto the CH3. We can do that by using chlorine and UV light. We've seen something similar to in a free radical reaction. So use chlorine and UV light to replace one of the H's with a Cl. Um, and then what we can do is we can add potassium cyanide. You need alcohol and water. Potassium cyanide uh, needs alcohol and water um, as a solvent in there. So the cyanide then replaces the B, the Cl by nucleophilic substitution. And now I've lengthened that chain. So the key was to lengthen the chain to two carbons long off the benzene from a methyl group. That was the clue that we needed potassium cyanide in alcohol and water. And now we've got potassium cyanide. All I need to do is add H's on there to make um, CH2, CH2, that should say CH2, NH2. Um, so a methyl, uh, a benzene ring with CH2, NH2 on there. And the easiest way to add H's is by using hydrogen nickel.